Hello, and welcome to the Profit Builder blog. I'm Vicki Suter, your host. These blog posts are intended to really help you increase the ability that you have as a leader and a business owner to generate more profits in your business and to be able to spend less time working in your business and really love what you do again. And so I really focus on what are the ways that I can give you ways of thinking about your business to help you do that, but also really important are tools and strategies and tactics that will actually help you execute and implement what it is that we talk about in these blog posts. Today, I'm super excited about my guest, Lewis Wire with Carmel Builders. And um, I met Lewis a few months back at a national conference and we got to talking about him and his business. And he told me that he had taken the business over, bought the business from his parents, and he had gone through that whole succession planning that I am seeing so many of my clients in the process of right now. And I see how so many people have questions and, and are working through that whole process of how do I do that? How do I do it well? How do I do it in a way that's fair and equitable to everybody concerned, and in a way that keeps the culture of the company um, in harmony. Uh, and I really appreciate it as I listened to Lewis talk about the process that he went through with his folks. And I thought that you would really get a lot of value out of hearing from him how this process went for him too. So Lewis, thank you so much for being here. I really am so excited to have you as a guest. Well, you're welcome, Vicki. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I know you have a lot to share with people, but before, like, we have some questions that I'm going to ask you. Before I jump in, would you please just tell people a little bit about Carmel Builders and how long you guys have been in business, what your focus is, and so on, and then we'll launch into the whole, how did this transition occur with your folks? Sure. Well, we're, we're excited that we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, so this is our 40th year in business. We are, we're a design build remodeling firm. We do a few custom homes as well every year, but you know, we've like so many people in our industry, we've, we've grown a lot. We've changed who we are through the years, but really the last 15, 20 years, design build remodel is our, is our main focus. So you have a team of designers and you do the build work. Yeah. Our team is, is, is really from, you know, total, turnkey production from designing it, planning it, product selection, construction, project management, you know, everything that, that you know, I think probably a lot, of, a lot of people who are watching this blog are, are doing as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Okay, good. So let me just ask you, like, um, I, because Lewis and I have talked a few times and it's been interesting hearing his journey um, of how he started with the business. So can you just talk a little bit about um, what that journey has been, how you came to be in the business, and also talk a bit about what motivated you to want to buy the business from your folks. That's a, that's, a, that's a question I get a lot. And I think I may be a little bit unique in that I never was going to do this. I, um, you know, growing up, my dad was, had a contracting business and I saw that he, you know, left early and got home late and you know, being a know-it-all teenager, I said, well, that's dumb. I'm going to go and work with my head and real money. <laughs> and uh, so I went, into, I went into the hospitality industry. I actually worked in hotels and I did you know, consulting for the hotel industry. And, and uh, I, I tell the story a lot. But really for me, everything changed on 9-11 because I, I was in New York two days before. And you know, the travel industry changed. And you couldn't show up at, a, show up at an airport two minutes before your flight. And I also, you know, it also made you think about your family. You know, I mean, I think we all probably everyone who lived through that kind of had that same kind of that, you know, feeling of what's really important. And I realized I kind of want to be around the people that I care about. So I moved back to Wisconsin and just my dad at that time was just kind of figuring out what the heck he wanted to do with the company. And I said, well, I'll help you get your accounts in order. I, I like numbers. I'm a number guy. And, um, so I helped him do that, and it kind of dawned on me over the couple of months of working with him that remodeling and hotels are actually very similar. Um, at the end of the day, keep it clean, make sure things are ready um, when you say they're going to be, be a good communicator, be polite, treat people the way you want them to treat you, and you're gonna generally have happy guests in the hotel and happy clients in remodeling. And so that was 2002, 
And I love that by the way. Started. Yeah, so that just kind of got me well, got me going. Yeah, nice. I mean, it's a nice way to frame ultimately um, what we do. And uh, yeah, so it's nice. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, so that's. So I, so I don't know. I mean, it, somewhere in that first six months, I, I joke around because I was in my late twenties and I said, well, I'm going to retire for like three months, which was, as it turns out way too early. You can't retire in your late twenties unless you're someone in <laughs> Silicon Valley, maybe. But um, my dad's like, my dad came to me and, and we were just talking about it. He said, you know, I think you could really do something great with this company. What do you think? And I said, you know, I actually kind of liking it. So I started doing sales and just some project management work with him and, and really, that was my background was project management in, in my hotel consulting world. So I, I kind of got that. And, and again, I just started to see all the things that I really liked about it. And um, it just kind of became the decision that we made together. Like, okay, let's, let's turn this company into something that, that, that I can take over. We didn't really know what we were doing. And I'll tell you, and you, I'll keep coming back to this over and over during our interview, is, is that we should have started it sooner and planned it out better. Um, because we all, between my dad, my mom, and I, I think we all wanted the exact same thing, but it's still really hard to get to that. And so we... Um, so when we you say that you time. should have started it sooner and thought it out better, what, how so? Well, I think in 2002, it was more a matter of, okay, well, why don't you come on board and let's see what happens. And I think even when I came on board, we had talked about it, but it was kind of off the record. You know, we didn't really ever sit down and finalize it. It was always just assumed, well, Lewis will end up taking over the company. And I assumed that they assumed it. So we all had the same assumption, but we never really started sitting down to talk about what that really meant uh, until several years later. And uh, what do you think would have been different if you would have started talking about it sooner? How would that have, how would that have altered what you did up until well, the, when you started to formalize it? I think we would have probably just, it probably just would have been a little bit simpler. Um, it probably would have saved us some money. Um, you know, there's expenses with, as, I'll, as as you and I talked about, and we brought in someone else to help us kind of negotiate our way through it. Um, I think we probably would have, maybe just a, a little bit less painful of an experience. And it wasn't painful, I, I, I say all the time. My parents and I, we have a great relationship. We agreed on where we wanted to get to. And even then, with us being like, I mean, there's mutual respect. There is definitely, you know, mutual goal of where we're going to be. We had a very similar idea of the value of the business. We had all those things in agreement. And it was still hard. And I think that's the thing that I would, I would counsel anybody is realize it's tough. So um, I'm going to kind of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tug on this question a little bit more because I think you're touching on something that um, happens, especially when there's succession happening within a family in a business, or even with even with major, um, you know, managers or, or you know, lead employees within a company who are going to take it over. There's this: how do we have that conversation early enough on? And uh, so I want to, I want to know, like, because I think that's what people want to know. It's like, they are thinking they should be doing it. What are the conversations that they should be having that you wish you and your mom and dad would have had earlier on? I think the biggest one was setting down the, the th one of the things I think is really important is that you need to recognize there's a difference between who owns the company, who manages the company and who leads the company. And those are three separate things. And the ownership is, I think, what everybody thinks about because they say, okay, well, I'm going to give my son or daughter, they're going to buy it out, or I'm going to sell it to my employee for X dollars. And I think that can be generally figured out pretty well unless there's a major difference on what the value is. But assuming that you know, you're, you're working with people are reasonable, I don't think that's generally that, the sticking point. But but leadership and management are different. You know, the management is kind of who's responsible for that day-to-day -day operations. But the leadership is such a weird thing because leadership is who do people come to when there is an issue? Who do people really look to? Whose actions set the tone of the culture of the company? And I, and I think- You really wait until ownership changes in order to have that transition change? Yeah, if you do, it'll never work. And I think, I, honestly, I-, I, I I tell my dad this a lot, and, and my mom as well, but my dad, you know, was definitely was the leader of our company. My mom, my mom had a 
key role, but you know, at the end of the day, the culture was, you know, what was Tom doing? And he did a really good job of kind of just stepping out of that role um, pretty decisively and really without us even talking about it too much, it just kind of happened. And I'm very lucky because I kind of realized that there was also this leadership void and he kind of pushed me into it. But uh, mm -hmm. I think that's so critical. And I think that if we had recognized that sooner, so I, if it were me, I would say, get the management role first. So kind of get this person into the management, you know, kind of day-to-day -day operations in charge stuff, then the leadership, and then the ownership can kind of happen whenever. I mean, truthfully, the ownership could happen 20 years down the road. Your key employees aren't going to really know. They, they care who's right. managing and who's leading, not really who's filing the taxes on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's a nice distinction. Yeah. Um, because sometimes that, I, I can see that, that that focus becomes on ownership as opposed to there's this whole sort of um, back of back of house uh, things that sure. you need in order in terms of people, as you say, knowing um, who are they reporting to, who is the person that they should be going and asking questions of. And I would also, so let me, so I see that from a management point of view. From your point of view, where did the distinction come in in terms of that um, it's like go to Lewis versus go to Tom? Where did that leadership transition come into play? And, um, and, and what, how did you and Tom navigate that? How did you make that transition happen? Because I can see that that's a sticking point and I've seen that with people where that becomes a little more challenging and, it, and I think that you guys did a nice job with that. So how did you navigate that? Well, I think we did it, it through um, a lot of trial and error. <laughs> I think that if I had done it differently, you asked before what we've done differently, I think we would have probably even set some very clear almost like a transition job description. Um, talking to another remodeler I know, and I, I suggested that they do that because I wish we had, which is, okay, for this year, this is my job description. This is what I do. This is what you know um, I'm in charge of. And then next year, now I'm in charge of this. So kind of getting that description put together. I think, um, I think that we did a good job though because a lot of it, frankly, my 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 dad and my and my mom as well were both pretty good about when people came to them saying, I don't know, ask Lewis. <laughs> and uh, I think honestly, that's probably the hardest thing for the first generation. Uh, I know they both told me that, um, that they did struggle with this idea of like, you know, where do I fit in? You know, what's my what's my position here? You know, where do but just realizing that. If they answered the question or they took ownership of it, it was, um, it, it actually hurt me and it hurt the ability to transfer it over. And I'll tell you, I've learned from that just as a leader. Now it's, it's really important for me not to just jump in when a question comes in that should be handled by one of my team members. Because if I take it, then I'm just, it really in a way, I'm undermining them. And, and I, I learned that from my parents. They were I, just, I think, frankly, I think I'm very lucky because they were really good at it. That's <laughs> um, great. We also all recognize that, boy, it could have been a lot rougher than it was. And it was, and again, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like we just showed up one day and wrote some papers and, all right, there we are. We're good to go. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for that. So, in terms of this transition from manager to leader, if you had uh, a, a piece of advice, around that and how to make that transition work better. Uh, you said um, have a job description that clearly defined that role from the distinction of the role from manager to leader and what is the role of, a, what is the job description of that leader? Is there anything else that um, in terms of, and, and I guess I'll especially ask in terms of the team in that transition with the rest of the team, how did that go? Uh, how did that go with them and how did that get communicated to them? And is there anything, yeah, any advice that you have about that? Yeah, I think the, the one thing is that we, we probably could have done a better job communicating with the team what the timeline was going to be. It was almost like you know, we knew about it. So the, the three of us had a pretty good idea of what this was going to entail and how long it was going to take and where we were. But we never really told the rest of the team. They knew it was happening. 
Um, in hindsight, I would say that we should have been a lot more clear. I'm not saying that they need to know every detail of it, but you know, twice a year, you know, just kind of a check in like, hey, this is the time frame, this is the plan we're trying to to go. We're on schedule. You know, Lewis is going to take you know full ownership in 2016. He's going to be general manager in 2012. You know, we we kind of knew that was happening, but we didn't really tell him until it happened. Again, I think I'm pretty lucky because. Um, Neither of my parents really stepped on my toes during that. But had we written it down, I think that would have helped. You know, another thing that I think we didn't do till after transition was over um, was really sit down and define our, our really, really good, strong mission statement for what the company is under me. So it has changed. Our mission statement is different than it was 15 years ago. And I think that that's really important that if you kind of say, this is what the company's mission statement is going to be. This is, you know, if you have a great one, awesome. If you don't, get one that you can use to guide you. And then also a set of core values, which, which we've always had, but we never really defined them very well. They kind of shifted from, we had. Yeah, so talk a little bit about that because core values, I, I, wanna, I wanna reiterate something that you just said, because I think that's super important that one of the things I, I like that, that you did is you um, realigned the mission statement with okay well that's what it's been what and what is our mission as we go forward and as i'm at the lead with this team i could see that that would be a really nice way of um, bringing you and the team together to create your mission go forward which is a way to bring some alignment with you and your team as the leader it helps so much keep in mind that i didn't do it till 18 months after transition so okay but you did so do as I say, not as I did. Right <laughs> well, yeah, and you did it. You're just saying you would have done it earlier. I would have done it before the transition because to me, it actually helps define the transition. Like, what are we trying to be? Who are we going to be? Because we're not the same company that we were when it was Tom and one or two guys. We're a different firm now. Our mission might be the same, but it's probably tweaked a little bit. You have to keep those things somewhat fresh, yeah. I think. But. Well, I, yeah, and I could see that that's a really nice way for you to um, bring alignment with you and, and your team as a leader. Yeah. So that's I, really I think cool. that's really it because it got everybody else to kind of like buy in and be kind of excited when they see that, you know, it's, it's one sentence, but it, it does so much and it helps make people feel that, okay, this is, this is something exciting. This is something, you know. And that they can align behind with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I so I want to go back to what you started to talk about because I I was um, I appreciated when we were talking that you were talking about the um, whole thing about identifying core values and how that was a very important factor for you and and Tom and Barbara your mom and dad as you made this transition. Um, can you just talk about that? Well, I just think that, that at the end of the day, if you can, if you can define your core values, they, they're going to answer probably 90% of the questions that you have, maybe 95. Um, and How so? Well, if you run into a, you know, does, it, does a decision align with your core values? I mean, our core values are very simple. They're be kind, do the right thing, consider the future, and seek to collaborate. So if, Let's say that one more time, Lois. I should be slower, right? Be kind, do the right thing, seek to collaborate, and consider the future. And so whenever anything comes up, you just have to say, like the first one is the most important. Is it kind? Is it the nice thing to do? Are you being, don't be a jerk, right? <laughs> and, there's, and, you know, that actually helped. I, honestly, that's, that's, that one is straight from the words of my, of my, straight from the mouth of my mother. That has always been one of her most important things in life. And it's, and so when you're having a discussion, you know, when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, you know, it is easy with family to get irritated. Uh, I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but sometimes you're No, family. we but never get irritated with that. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, are you being kind? You know, are you being, are you being kind to this person or are you just letting your frustrations, you know, do the right thing, which is just, you know, be honest, you know, I mean, just that can mean so much stuff. And uh, I've always looked at that as, you know, if, would you do the same thing, you know, if no one knew what you were doing, <laughs> you know, and if, and if it's, and if it's not, then you're not following that, you know, seeking to collaborate, working together, don't go off and be a, 
lone wolf and then consider the future which means so much to to everything so for us with the with the business transition how do we make our you know how do we what is this going to look like in a year how does this work so like with my parents a big thing was okay how do we transition this financially that a it doesn't saddle me with this big debt but b takes care of them and we ended up coming up with a pretty I think an interesting way to transfer the ownership. And I think there's a lot of ways to do that, but you have to think about that. And, you know, I think it's important that if you're, if you're buying a business from your, from a family member, especially, you know, you realize that, you know, a lot of my parents worth is tied up in this business. So how do I get it from them? But I'm not gonna, I don't want to sell my house and live out of a van in order to buy a, to buy a remodeling company. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, Mm-hmm. You just have to you let those values guide you, and I think it helps. Yeah. So I, I wrote down those core values as you were talking because I really love um, that uh, way of looking at, you know, when I have a context within which all of our decisions and conversations and negotiations will occur, then it becomes the guiding post for me to. Um, stay on track with what I value and what we value together. So, and, and that I, I love that you talk about that that's the core values of how you run your business. Um, it's a, it's super simple. It's succinct and it is the thing that helps us true back up to what's important. So, um, so I, I like that. I, I like that a lot. And I think that whether for any of us who are in business, uh, whether we're in this process as you just went through in succession planning, or if you're in the, um, you know, just running your business, uh, it's good to have those core values that help keep us aligned. So thank you for sharing those and for the depth you went into to explain them. So, so the, the next thing that you started to talk about here was the financial piece and how uh, that those core values helped you um, be clear as you went into the financial part of the whole situation. Can you just talk about that and um, how did that the process of working out the financial part go for you? And were there any sticking points or areas of disagreement? Like how did you, how did all that? And you don't have to go into the dollars and cents and all. I'm not, I'm not being, I don't want to be intrusive, but simply so that people can understand and have an idea of what are some of the ways that a succession plan could look and buying a business or selling a business, that there are lots of different ways to approach it. And I think that you guys had a, a unique way of doing that, that, um, yeah, I'd just like to, you to share that with people, please. Well, you know, it was that was an interesting part because at the end of the day, I knew that, you know, this was a lot of the business was, that was my parents' retirement plan, you know, or it was, it was tied up into the business. And so it, I don't know that we really had a huge difference on differentiate different opinion on the value of it. We had, we definitely had some opinion on it. I think that talking to a number of people around the country over the last few years, generally speaking, the first generation, Un- overvalues it and the second generation undervalues it. Um, there's, you know, there's goodwill, but how much is it worth? No one really knows. Um, at the end of the day, we ended up looking at it like this was, which was how much do my parents need to be, to have to live their retirement at, you know, to, to basically maintain their lifestyle, which luckily for me, my parents, they're not, they were not, they're very good with their money. They weren't living on crazy amounts of debt, you know, or anything like that. And we kind of worked off of that. Um, they ended up giving me the company. Um, that was a great value to them because there's no tax um, implications. So they didn't have to pay tax on me purchasing it. But in exchange for giving me the company, we basically rebuilt the structure to give them a small percentage. So I actually, while I'm the majority owner, I actually only own 94% of the company each of three percent and we created a very interesting corporate structure where they sit on our board of directors and as board directors they receive a certain amount of a stipend in addition to three percent of the profits or six percent total so their board of directors stipend is in essence it kind of works like a pension for them so they get paid a fixed amount for the rest of their lives um I'm totally okay with it. It does a, lot, a couple of really nice things. Number one, I didn't have to borrow money to buy the company. So it saves me all of that interest. Um, it 
gives me a very flat amount that I have to pay. So it's super easy for budgeting. I know what that dollar amount is. Um, it also, because they are on the board of directors, it forces my dad to pick up the phone when I call if I have questions. <laughs> I'm joking slightly about that. He would pick up the phone anyways. But it does it it does keep them still involved to an extent. I mean, they don't have any operational control over the business and they can't come in, they can't hire and fire anybody, but uh, it just gives them a touch point. And every quarter we get together and just kind of review, you know, big picture financials and what we're doing. And I think they like that um, just to be, to throw a touch point in there. Um, so it's really good for, for me. It's good for them in that now they've got this, you know, kind of defined income. And, you know, if the company does well, which, you know, I'm having some good years, but, uh, you know, it's not a huge amount, but 6% is 6%. So they still get a little bit of a bump from that every year as well. And because we're an S corporation, if I choose to take money out of the company, um, for whatever reason, if, in the form of an S distribution, they are immediately, you know, I have for every dollar taken out, I have to take 94 cents and take six cents. So right. if it's really good and I take a bunch out, I'm like, oh, here you go. Here's some, some more for you. So um, it, it works out really well. It was a bit, it never thought we were going to do it that way. I always assumed that there would just be some sort of buy sell agreement. That they would be out for good. It's my company now and I'll take care of it. But uh, this has actually been fantastic. I'm really glad that we did it this way because um, it just it worked out really well. And I know now that they're, you know they're taken care of they know what they know what they're you know, like I said my mom says all the time we're living on a fixed income now that's whenever we go out for dinner and I get stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and you pay the bill it's not, not, not everything maybe actually but I'm, my birthday's coming up I think I'm here with <laughs> <laughs> do you think that um structuring it the way that you did also gave them the opportunity to have a sense of still having connection to the business, that sense of belonging and, you know, contribution that had, has, I would imagine, you know, it's like for any of us who've ever owned a business, it sort of defines our, our sense of value as human beings. And so letting go of that, it sounds like this structure could have been um, one that let them ha still uh, hold on to some of that sense of contribution and belonging. Do you, did you, was that part of what was behind how you structured it with them? Yeah, I, it was. I mean, I think a large part that they weren't sure, like, what's my life going to be like when I'm not, you know, I'm not only Carmel Builders. I mean, we're, we're like I said, 40 years in business. So you know, 35 years of both of their lives of this, I mean, that's a big, that's a big amount of time. Um, and I think so. And uh, what's funny is that if you were to ask them now, and I know there's a, there's a, um, a chance maybe you will, but if, if you ask them now, uh, I think they would say, yeah, it turns out that wasn't that important to me once it was gone. But it's really hard, you know? I mean, how do you recognize and come to, you know, you know seeing what your life is going to be like when this isn't part of your life, I think is tough. And I think that, that that's something that we all face in different facets, you know? It's, yeah. You know, when, you're, when your child goes away to college and now you're, you know, all of a sudden you're an empty nest. What does that feel like? When, when you as a, when you graduate college and you're an adult in the first, I mean, there's, those things happen in life. And I think letting go of this business that you owned and, and, and is, is something very near and dear to you is going to be tough. But I do think that, you know, now we're looking back on it three years past and I think they're both like, yeah, I don't really miss it that much. But if you had asked them four years ago, they would have said, I'm always going to want to be involved to some extent. Yeah. Know. Interesting. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, uh, when we seem to fill the time. I've seen that with a number of other people when they've transitioned out of their business and they're not sure how it's all going to look. But I talked to them a few years later and they're like, I don't know how I got so much done. Like I get so much done in my life. I don't know how I ever worked. They are, they are so busy. I'm not kidding you. They are so busy. And, uh, and, and I will tell you that for me personally, that's very great. That's very gratifying. And I think that that's something I would tell anybody who's in that second generation. Um, so don't take for granted just how big of a deal it is to start something from scratch. Um, it's a really big deal and it's really, it, I, you know, 
my dad and, and my mom, but you know, my dad, you know, I remember my mom's part of it too, because heck, she was raising, you know, five kids and trying to make all this happen. And, you know, 1979, nothing really going on. You know, I mean, the oil crisis, and my dad just decides to start a business because he doesn't like the attitude that his previous employer like took with clients. And, you know, he had a he had a pickup truck and a tool belt. And now I'm paying him to not show up to work. I mean, that's kind of cool. And I think that we should all be fair. We should all recognize that that's a big deal. You know, that's, and so I feel that there's a, there's a responsibility for me and I, that I have a, a debt of gratitude and a debt of responsibility to, to him to, to keep that going, to make it, you know, you know, so all of a sudden, well, my job, dad, is to get the company to pay me not to work faster than it did for you. So yeah. nice. nice. I, think it's, I just think it's really important that we don't take it for granted. And I think, I, I know that when I was younger, I certainly did. And probably even up until when we started this transition, and even during it, I probably took it for granted more than I should have. Yeah. Well, Louis, this I think this is a, a really nice place to um, bring this to closure. And I, but I, and I will ask you: um, Is there anything that you would add? So, if uh, and I'm going to say, but both for people out there who are who are in your position, who are looking to buy the business from their uh, their parents or their employer, or for people who are business owners who are looking to sell their business, any other final words of advice or recommendations that you have? And I know that you have a, a guideline that we'll talk about in just a second, but before we get to that. You know, really the, the, the two most important things, we start early. Um, don't be, if it's something that you're considering, start talking about it. When I say start early, start communicating about it. Put stuff down in writing and, and understand that you're going to have disagreements and, and you need to come to an agreement before and that disagreements are okay and that we're not going to argue about the disagreements. It's really way more important to, to figure out what, your what you have in common what you agree upon then worry about what you disagree on and I think it's so easy when you start getting into like maybe it's the time frame maybe it's the dollar amount maybe it's the management roles maybe it's I don't know focus on what you agree on and build off of that don't try to fix everything you disagree at the end of the day you're going to disagree on some stuff you're never going to go through this whole thing not having some disagreements but if you focus on what you agree on those disagreements you end up realizing they're not that big of a Great. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you said that because um, we're not going to always agree and we're not always going to be on the same page with somebody else. And is it, even as I was listening to you though, that um, your core values of be kind, do the right thing. Um, what did you so, say? Uh, seek out collaboration and uh, consider the future that, uh, and you have said this to me as we've talked, that those things kind of guided you in those sticky moments, in those moments when you had disagreements and you weren't aligned. And at least it, at the, in the, sometimes even just in the moment that it was a thing that, um, you know, even just to be kind, right? I'm super irritated. I'm going to walk away from this conversation or whatever. <laughs> think that's the most important one. That's yeah. the most important one. <laughs> yeah, I can totally see that. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your experience and your um, knowledge of how this process worked and what worked and what didn't work. I appreciate you uh, being so authentic and real about, you know, all the parts of it. Um, so thank you. You're and very welcome. I know that you were so gracious and kind to uh, put together something for this post, for this video that you said you would share about sort of like this checklist of things. Could, can you just tell people about that and yeah, make sure know, you put the URL where people can get it um, within the post and within the video? Yeah, it's, you know, this was, this was kind of fun for me because as we, as we kind of talked about it, we kind of prepped for what we're going to talk about, I just realized that, you know, there's all these things that I realized that I have floating around in my brain that I'd love to, to share with you. So I just put together a real simple bullet point list of just things to consider, kind of some tips. It, you know, it's not a, it's not a follow this and I guarantee you your, your transition will go smoothly type of thing, but it's just some good starting points for I think anyone who's, who's looking to do this to, to take some time 
read through it and, um, and, and use it to guide you in, in what you're looking to do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll make sure that people, uh, like I said, that URL will be down there at the bottom of the video and in the post that people can click on it and get it. And again, Lewis, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise and your experience. Uh, I look forward to talking with your mom and dad and about their experience as well. I hope you found this week's post to be helpful. If you really are ready to take the next step towards reclaiming your time, earning more money, then you want to probably check out my book, The Profit Bleed. It has got a ton of valuable resources that will help you in increasing your profits, reclaiming your time, and refinding the joy in your business and in your life again. And my passion is supporting contractors and leaders to improve their skills and ultimately to grow, thrive, and prosper in their business and in their lives. So if you liked this episode, please subscribe to my channel. And I would ask that if you enjoyed it, please share it with other people that you know. That's the way that I know that I can really help the most number of people make a difference in the world. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you next time on the Profit Builder blog.